And here lies a crucial error on the part of the United States, a lack of understanding or perhaps a reluctance to acknowledge the existential importance of Taiwan for China. Hi, hello, and welcome to another video. In this video, um, I'm going to talk about the video that I made a few weeks ago where I asked why does China tolerate the presence of U.S. troops and the sale of weapons to Taiwan? It seems to have gathered quite a lot of uh, attention. So I'm now wanting to ask a new question. Um, what is the essence? What is the importance of publicly outlining your red lines as a nation? Why do nations resort to threats? So let's talk about that right now. As a core, a threat basically is a tool of dissuasion. It seeks to dissuade your adversary from certain actions or compel them towards behaviors that you would rather they do. This is the fundamental principle inherent in the concept of a threat. It is important to highlight here that threats are not issued merely as precautionary warnings. However, for a threat to have any sort of influence, it must be credible. The, the receiving part, the, 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 comport, the counterpart, the person receiving the threat, must perceive the issuer as possessing both the capability and the determination to carry out that threat. Imagine if a small child were to threaten to leave home. That's an unlikely assertion that, that, that will not deserve to be taken seriously. Credibility is not just about capability, but also about the perceived willingness to act. Imagine a fierce looking dog that might have a very impressive bark, but if it actually never chases the intruder, then people will eventually become bolder and start ignoring the barking and the warnings. And that relates a little bit to the challenge that China faces. Um, it, it's basically the skepticism that surrounds the credibility of its red lines. The United States in particular seems not to, not to consider those as sincere. This skepticism bodes quite poorly, both for China and for Taiwan, because when China carries out measured and moderate retaliation for violations of its red lines in Taiwan, think about when Nancy Pelosi visited the island or the military exercise when Lai in his inaugural address was talking about Taiwan independence. Well, this, this moderate retaliation ends up being invariably adverse for China. Why? China bears a high cost to its image. It suffers denigration and inevitably is gradually being labeled as the aggressor by the United States. So, so it's like there's no winning. Ideally, China would prefer to abstain from responding to provocations entirely, particularly when it comes to Taiwan. But that's not possible. That's not the case. You keep getting provo provocations all the time. Now, in essence, the effectiveness of a, threat, of a threat doesn't depend only on it being articulated, but on the perception of credibility, a dynamic that China has been facing recently as it navigates these complexities of the strategic posture with America and Taiwan. So, how can China cultivate the credibility of its threat, or how can any country do this? Credibility in issuing threats boils down to reputation. It's about taking incremental steps, a gradual process, a strategy that, in my opinion, China has employed quite skillfully so far. A nation doesn't necessarily establish itself as a serious player on the global stage if it immediately resorts to an extreme measure like bombing or invasion. Extreme measures not only carry disastrous consequences for the population, but it also in involves uh, the risk of um, self-annihilation. It is also not prudent to simply bluster about invading territories. An invasion is a costly and uncertain endeavor. That's why I find it important to, to, to note and remind people of the conspicuous absence of this kind of rhetoric on the part of the Chinese government when it comes to Taiwan. I'm still waiting for people to show me in Chinese media any instance when China has used the word invasion when referring to Taiwan. I'm still waiting. So instead of bluster, credibility is forged on the basis of rather smaller or seemingly mundane actions that are easily executed and have an impeccable success rate. Think of trade sanctions, yeah, well, flyovers, the, the straight assertive naval maneuvers around the east side of uh, Taiwan. These kind of actions around Taiwan establish China's reputation regarding its resolve 
to defend the island. So they, they'd serve it very, very well. Every nation must build its reputation uh, of uh, threats through two steps. First, you need to issue a threat and then, and this is crucial, follow through on that threat if it's initially ignored. Is that level of consistency that underpins the credibility. If you apply your threats sporadically, then you're inviting the skepticism. You're encouraging your adversaries to gamble against your resolve to follow through on your threats. Now, it is possible that threats can yield a result, right? It's possible that adversaries listen to the warning and refrain from the behavior that you did not want. Alternatively, there is the art of uh, strategic bluffing. When you issue threats without uh, an immediate intention of following through, relying simply on your established credibility of past actions to compel compliance. Think of nuking Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the case of the United States. But here's the crux. Bluffing is only effective when backed by genuine credibility. It's a delicate balance. Confidence without substance is useless. The credibility of threats is not about bragging or machismo. It's a pragmatic tool for maintaining peace. It's diplomacy in action, if you ask me. It's signaling your intentions in response to provocations, thereby helping to prevent dangerous escalations. Crucially, a credible threat must be linked to a specific and tangible consequence, a clear cause and effect scenario, because Vague warnings of, oh, there will be consequences or abstract threats really lack the force to generate serious consideration. The precision of a threat is, is paramount. Now, in essence, the credibility of issuing threats is not about bluster. It's about strategic communication. It's, it's a calculated dance, if you wish, aim at avoiding undesirable outcomes. It's the if you ask me, is the cornerstone of effective diplomacy, is ensuring that actions speak louder than words, and thus achieving peace amidst the tumultuous international relations that we see in today's world. Ensuring the clarity of these communicated threats and their unambiguous understanding by the counterpart is fundamental. Threats that are issued after the event, like the classic, oh, if you do this again, you're going to pay, they, they carry diminished weight as they appear to be more reactive than proactive. Also, empty threats or apocalyptic scenarios hold little weight in the realm of international diplomacy. Earning credibility in issuing threats is, is a meticulous effort. It's a vital tool in the diplomatic arsenal that demands sincere consideration and practice. The same goes for the crucial distinction between lacking credibility and possessing negative credibility. This is a trap that is best simplified by Russia's current situation. They say they're going to do something, they don't believe them. When a nation's threat lack credibility, has negative credibility, they become worse than having no credibility at all. They become a liability in your diplomatic arsenal. However, it is important to understand that threats have a limited effectiveness, especially when it comes to existential matters for the recipient. If I say, hey, if you breathe, I'm going to hit you, or if you eat, I'm going to hit you, these threats are going to fail because they target actions that are essential for my survival. It res renders these threats pointless. In such case, well, the threatened party is going to prioritize survival over complying with the threat. So, okay, hit me all you want, but I need to keep breathing. And here lies a crucial error on the part of the United States, a lack of understanding or perhaps a reluctance to acknowledge the existential importance of Taiwan for China. For China, the prospect of Taiwan's independence or its transformation into a U.S. military outpost is just intolerable. It's impossible. It's a scenario for which no cost is too high. China, though adverse as they are, to escalating conflict remains firm in defending its sovereignty. There is no ambiguity here. There's no room for speculation or wishful thinking. China's position transcends individual leadership also, be it Xi Jinping or his eventual replacement, whoever might lead the Chinese people. It is a matter of national imperative for them. If these red lines are crossed, the United States must prepare for the prospect of a hot war with China, a reality that really demands the 
utmost seriousness and must exclude any semblance of bluffing. Those people who fail to grasp, grasp this reality are endangering not only themselves but also the global geopolitical landscape. It, it's a blunt truth that deserves to be acknowledged and seriously contemplated and discussed in international forums. Unfortunately, the efforts of the Chinese government to strengthen the credibility of its threats seems to be failing short of their intended goal, in my opinion. It is true that China regularly responds in a similar fashion, proportionally, to U.S. actions against her, be it in the context of Taiwan or through targeted sanctions of companies or industrial sectors, you know. We, we've all heard about that, right? But is this is where my criticism comes from a very personal standpoint. I think that these responses lack the clarity and the consistency that is necessary for the counterpart, in this case the U.S., to perceive China's threat as credible. In terms of the specificity and the consistency of the threats, I think that China needs to improve. And a good example of this is the situation with the Philippine vessel, the Sierra Madre, on the disputed reef in the South China Sea. This example from the Philippine truly underscores this critical point. Mere retaliation isn't enough. Water cannons is not doing the job. And simply dismissing concerns about not being perceived as strong enough or vowing to demonstrate strength in the conflict, that's, that's, that's not going to work. The true goal is to deter action through the mere statement of a threat without the need to actual escalating the situation. And China has not achieved that deterrence in this case, as we can see on the daily. The concept of credibility of threats is deeply ingrained in the political and conflict theories in the United States. However, recent actions of the U.S. are demonstrating that they have strayed from this course. They're falling into the trap of excessive bluster, a hallmark of a declining empire. They're now talking about starting fight and wars in multiple fronts without taking into account strategic realities. That reveals an arrogance that's unbecoming of a real superpower. Now, on the other hand, China, with its aversion to unnecessary and armed conflicts demonstrated by the four decades of peace with its neighboring countries, and Vietnam is it's not worth mentioning, is weakening its threat credibility. As my mother used to say, patience achieves what happiness cannot. So let us hope that China's patience um, will do the trick so far. All right, guys. That's all the time for today. Thank you so much for watching. As always, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you like the content on my channel, consider subscribing. If you like the work that I do, make sure to hit the link in the description down below to buy me a cup of coffee. And if you're here in China, you can use the QR code on the screen to do the same. And to those of you who have been doing it since the beginning of the year, thank you so much. Your names are here on the screen as a thank you to you. <laughs> all right, guys. Until I see you again, take it easy. Bye for now.